Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. On April 12th, Matthew Goldstein announced that he was leaving the CUNY Chancellor's post after 14 years. As Chancellor Goldstein is widely credited with improving standards, creating more clearly defined roles for the community in senior colleges, and generating private support for CUNY's public mission, among many other substantial accomplishments. On April 23rd, the CUNY Board of Trustees unanimously selected William P. Kelly as interim chancellor designate, becoming inter interim chancellor beginning July 1st. Dr. Kelly joins us today to talk about the opportunities and the challenges facing CUNY in the second decade of the 21st century and beyond. He'll discuss his goals and his approaches. In his 36 years at CUNY, Dr. Kelly has served as a faculty member, a distinguished scholar and teacher of American literature at Queens College and the Graduate Center, and as a senior administrator. Most recently, he has served as president of the Graduate Center at City University, and before that, the Grad Center's provost and senior vice president. Dr. Kelly is the vice chairman of the CUNY Research Foundation and is a trustee of the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation. Dr. Kelly, as a scholar, is the author of Plotting America's Past, Fenmore Cooper and the Leather Stocking Tales, and his essays and reviews have appeared in a broad range of publications. Welcome, Mr. Interim <laughs> Chancellor Designate. <laughs> Pleasure to be here, Doug. Thanks for having me. Okay. As I mentioned, you served as a faculty member and senior administrator at CUNY forever. Forever. Exactly. Forever. 36 years or, or four decades. You've seen it all. You've seen the institution evolve. Talk about what CUNY was, how it's changed, and a little bit of what it might be before we get into specifics. Okay. Let me start with the constants. Go ahead. CUNY, from the time that, that I arrived in 1976, is remarkable for the, for the students. Let's start with those amazing students. You teach yep. here. I don't ah, need to tell you New about New York that. City kids. Remarkable. They change in terms of nationality or point of, of origin, but they're the same kids. Yep. They're looking to have a better life. They're looking for opportunities that only education can provide, and they bring with them to the classroom extraordinary vitality, energy. I felt privileged every day I walked into a classroom. I fell Me in too. love with the yep. place. First day I was, the first course I taught at Queens had 38 students from 24 different countries. And I thought, wow, you know, this is the future. This is the, the global world. university. Yep. This is the world. That hasn't changed. The commitment of the faculty hasn't changed either. The faculty that I worked with in 1976 aren't really different from the faculty that I work with now. These are people who embrace the mission of the city university, who see their charge as providing opportunity, access, uh, instruction to those students we just talked sure. about. That has also been inspiring to, to watch and to see. It's one of the great privileges of my life to be a colleague uh, in that faculty cohort. Um, what has, what's different? We were talking before we went on air about some of the changes in the city from mm -hmm. the mid-70s on. I arrived in the year after the city's fiscal crisis. The Gerald Ford to New York dropped dead. I, I lived through it. I got laid off in the first Fis wave of the fiscal crisis. First wave crisis. of the fiscal crisis. When I was applying to work at City University, my faculty members said, are you crazy? The place is, is retrenching. There aren't any jobs there. But it was the one job in the country I wanted. Mm -hmm. I arrived, again, to this extraordinary student population, to a cohort of committed colleagues. But all around the university, the city was in, in trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, as, as the, ben Schmidt, the report that Ben O'Schmidt shared in mm -hmm. 1995 said, woefully underfunded. Uh, infrastructure was, was crumbling. Uh, administrations came and went. There was a, a lack, I think, of coherence to what the university was about. So that while you were working with these extraordinary students, with great colleagues, you were operating in a university structure that wasn't supporting the aspirations of either the faculty or the students, at least not to the, the degree that one would, would wish. 
1999, uh, Mayor's Report, commissioned by then Mayor Giuliani, mm -hmm. chaired by Benno Schmidt, reports produces a document called An Institution Adrift, yep. which talks about some of the challenges that CUNY faces, having to do with many things, starting with funding, but also an issue of, of not enough students graduating, time to degree being a problem, lack of accountability, um, a whole raft of issues that were in play. Declining enrollment, declining faculty numbers, uh, a call for a reinvigoration of the system. And at that point, Chancellor Goldstein takes the helm. And like most people, I think, who have, have watched these 14 years and who have written about it of late mm -hmm. since he's announced his, uh, his uh, retirement from that position, stand in amazement at the job that, that he has done. I mean, you, you touched on a number of the issues. Sure, and, and, and he served as my president at Baruch and did the same thing yeah. at Baruch. But it's, what he brought to it were two things, in my, in my view, Doug. I mean, first, a vision for what the university might be, a vision informed by what the university always wanted to be, excellence and access, not either or, mm -hmm. but both and, and a commitment to educate the children of the whole people that goes back to 1847 with the founding of the Free Academy. Mm -hmm. None of that ever changes. That's a vision that he fully embraced. He also brought to it uh, a level of intelligence and competence that made that vision mm -hmm. a reality mm -hmm. so that the students' aspirations were more fully realized, the faculty were able to operate in a, in a frame that enabled them to do their very best work. So that's, that's how I would chart the, the arc. I think to answer the last part of your question, the future. Public higher education in this country is at a very difficult point. Just a couple of data points I'm sure you're familiar with. 1960, a third of every, uh, I'm sorry, 1960, two thirds of every American household had at least one resident who was under the age of 18. Mm -hmm. That number is now one third rather than two thirds. Mm -hmm. By 2030, there will be more people over 65 in this country than under 18. Hopefully I'm there around then, <laughs> having passed that line a while ago. You Go ahead. both, my friend. But what, what those points suggest is a kind of shift mm -hmm. in national priorities, an emphasis on health care, on security, on tax relief, all of those things that are inimical to robust funding for, for public higher education. Increasingly, universities are being asked to do more with less. Uh, enrollment increases, particularly as cost at private universities continue to escalate. Public universities are faced with very difficult choices in terms of uh, how far can you raise tuition, partly determined by regulations at the state mm -hmm. level, partly determined by the mandate that we have to serve uh, the public. And how do you manage to do that with those resource demands being asked to be everything, massification, more students, less yep. money, all yep. of the stuff yep. that you're familiar with. That challenge for me, I think, and for, for the university over the next stretch, is how do you maintain the momentum that CUNY has built over the last 15 years in a very difficult circumstance and to continue not only to sustain that growth, but to press forward into, into other areas. Okay, why did you agree to take this job? Yeah. Why take the job as interim chancellor? And be, I, I presume you're a candidate for the permanent job? I am not. Uh, the policy of the board is quite clear in this regard. Interim uh, people who hold these positions on an interim basis are not permitted to be candidates for the job. No exceptions? The, the terms of my appointment were clear in that Ooh. regard. I took it with that understanding. I'm here to do the best job I can for as long as I'm doing it. Oh, okay. Now... Talk about following the tough act, following Goldstein. Yeah, I mean, several people have said to me, look, is this, you know, do you hope to do more of the same? And I think there's a major difference between doing more of the same and maintaining momentum. In the Cratylus. Nice, very nice. Plato quotes Heraclitus as saying, no man can step into the same river twice. The goals are the same. They have to do with building a strong faculty, sustaining increasing standards, maximizing opportunities for students, building a strong financial base, developing new revenue streams, particularly in the area of philanthropy, meeting all of the goals and the objectives of public universities called upon to meet. And I would say Chancellor Goldstein has achieved all of those ends brilliantly. 
those are the same goals. They're not just the goals for CUNY, mm -hmm. they're the goals for every public university in the United States. We're, by the way, 83% of U.S. students enroll. That's, that's, I know. that's the future. But the river isn't the same river. So for me, the challenge is attaining those same goals under different circumstances. Things change constantly. It's a world of flux. So the first part of the challenge is sustaining those goals, building, continuing on the momentum, not by doing the same things, but by doing things that will take us to a similar place. The other piece is, how do we think about the future? I mean, there are lots of things to think about that I think we are positioned to do that weren't entirely possible in circumstances historically where the university was not so well positioned. Like most universities, there's a notion of how you can share resources, how you can leverage what is available. This university is better positioned than, than any other. We have 24 colleges, ranging from community colleges through comprehensive baccalaureate institutions, professional schools. It's a dazzlingly broad and diverse system. Yep. 270,000 students, another 220 in continuing ed. Right. It's probably the 100th largest city in the United States. Bingo. So how do you share resources effectively across that institution? When you look, go to meetings and you hear other systems heads talk about how we can leverage in California resources that exist at Berkeley with those that exist at mm -hmm. UCLA, mm -hmm. that's a much more difficult problem that really relies on, on the digital and, and we're still very much at the bleeding edge in that enterprise. At CUNY, we're all public transportation away. I'm biased in this regard because at the Graduate Center, we operate consortially, collaboratively. We right. draw our faculty from the CUNY colleges. We send our students out to teach undergraduates at the colleges. Fifty years ago, Albert Bowker was confronted with what to do with doctoral education at CUNY. Each college wanted to do its own, sure. own programs. He realized that there would not be resources to sustain high quality uh, doctoral programs at each of these colleges went toward a collaboration. I think it was 50 years ahead of his time, as in many other things. So part of the challenge is thinking about how we can leverage the scale of this system going forward. How would any you think it? Yeah, I'm sorry. sorry, any specifics? Yeah, I mean, all conversations in this way tend to turn toward the digital. Um, I think there is no question that the future of higher education will be dramatically impacted in the near, middle, and long term by innovations in the digital frame. Exactly what they'll be, how they'll work, I think anybody who tells you they know is, is not to be trusted. The notion of MOOC stands in as a kind of emblem. Explain MOOC. Massive, uh, massively enrolled online course. Um, it's a course that is offered digitally to mass enrollment that pe and people engage primarily in this thing from uh, strictly on an online basis, mm -hmm. not a hybrid where they yep. combine all yep. the different ways of looking at it. And a lot of places have embraced MOOCs as the kind of silver bullet that's going to slay the fiscal problems, add enrollment, um, reduce cost of instruction, and so forth. I I'm not remotely sold on MOOCs. I think that's a view shared by my most university presidents across the country. And a lot of faculty as I well. agree. I think that they suggest a kind of old school for my view, retroact retrograde notion of how education happens, far too passive. You acquire a product and people sit there and watch it. I mean, it's, yeah, it's four or it five. It doesn't have to be, but yes. But, but yes. I mean, I realize that technology has advanced. That said, where, where the notion of the digital has moved and where it is going to move is wildly more exciting. It has to do with much more proactive engagement. People are now talking about POOCs, which are participatory uh, online courses. There are opportunities that are already realized in many parts of the country. I think of programs at Duke and at Michigan State mm -hmm. where collaborative research possibilities exist, yep. not just uh, across a college, but a, in, the, in our case, not across a single CUNY college, across the system, across the United States, right. across the world. That's the future. Uh, and from my point of view, that's the, a challenge that a system as large as CUNY needs to embrace. And to become a model, we are, you know, we are the largest urban university in the United States, arguably in the world. world. We are the model of how these things can operate. Um, I think we have big responsibility. Bingo! It's it, particularly Bing. for an English professor. Yep. I'm, oh. I wasn't trained in in digital laboratories, but a lot of the activity in this area comes out of the humanities. 
Uh, so I have been involved in this for some time. But no question, it's a huge challenge when you think about the size, the scale. And what's at stake? What's at stake, Doug, are the lives of our students. Mm -hmm. These are students who depend upon this university to provide them with the same kind of opportunity that CUNY has provided since 1847. Mm -hmm. That's a heavy mantle to wear, but one that I embrace with great enthusiasm. You talked about the, the you know the the globalization yeah, yeah. of education and, and, and globalization period. How does CUNY best participate in global higher ed given our you know our cost, our staffing structures, yeah, yeah. our student incomes? Let me start with the assumption we need to. Go we, ahead. Are, we are a global city. Uh, and we seek to serve our students who will be operating in a global world. The easiest point of view on this is to think about how we move students back and forth across, across the world. And as you say, there are challenges given the income circumstances of many of our students, given the, the challenges that we have from a structural point of view. But in this one, I really feel that I am qualified to speak. Go! Oh. For 25 years, I directed the New York, uh, the CUNY Paris Exchange Program in which we sent students and faculty from all of the CUNY colleges to the University of Paris, to its many branches. The University of Paris and CUNY look an awful lot alike. We brought Paris students here, we sent CUNY students there, faculties moving back, literally thousands of students across the 25 years that I did this. Last, I stopped counting about how many children came out wow. of this with students. At one point, there were 12, 12 babies that I knew of who were named France Amérique. Uh, and, you know, hey, I was, you what know, better sign of success? Symbolic godfather yes, to several. Yes, come on. It was a fabulous thing, and it continues to be. Other Parises, though? But, Go ahead, I'm yeah, sorry. But I'm just saying, the way this worked was on, to say it worked on a shoestring, was to, be, to suggest many re more resources than actually existed. Students who went to Paris from CUNY paid, no, paid their CUNY tuition, paid no tuition in Paris. Paris students paid their regular French tuition, which is quite modest, mm -hmm. uh, and they paid no tuition in New York. This was agreed with the support of chancellors in the past and with the Board of Trustees. So that cost was absorbed. We had a director on either side of the ocean who oversaw getting students registered for courses, uh, helping them to find au pair positions, mm -hmm. whatever. Both the Paris students and the CUNY students remarkably resilient. These are folks who know how to make things work. The great plus of this program, it wasn't academic tourism. These were students who were taking courses with American students at Queens or Brooklyn City. Um, and our students were taking courses at Paris Trois or Paris Wheats, any of the branches and so forth. It was a remarkably positive experience at almost, I mean, at m incredibly minimal cost. There's no reason why that program can't be expanded. To, I had dinner the other night with a, a university president from Istanbul talking about doing I'll some, go. something. So, oh, well, I, I, I want to go. go. Exactly. Well, we'll sign you up. Thank you. Um, I knew this interview would pay off. So, so, sorry. so that part of it, moving students and faculty back and forth, not an impossibility. The university is already developing those plans. Jim Meiskins at Queens, Karen Gould at Brooklyn, those presidents of those institutions. Uh, Groups Fernand. doing it. I'm going to Ghent deliver a, paper a, with the a, University of Brussels. Right. And I think whatever the Ghent. university can do to press that, and it would be one of my priorities while I'm doing this job, to uh, to make that happen. But that's only tip of iceberg stuff. Again, we go back to the digital. People were doing joint degrees all over the world. Seminars are happening in real time in Beijing mm -hmm. and at the same time in Berkeley, in Chicago and Buenos Aires. There is no reason why this university shouldn't expand its participation in that kind of scholarly exchange. You can have undergraduate classes in which you have participants from many sites across the world. That's really where the digital mm -hmm. interests me, not the MOOC imagined in the most basic mm -hmm. term of MOOC, most reductive sense. But the possibility yep. to bring people together across the world, the techniques, the capacities are there. I think that's another major step that CUNY will take Excellent. over the next couple Excellent. of years. Another issue, since the fiscal crisis of the 70s, the state has had responsibility for the senior colleges yeah. in the city, for the community colleges. Is it time to rethink that relationship? That's a really intriguing question, Doug, and I know a lot of people have been brooding the notion around. I mean, obviously, circumstances have reversed to some extent. State fiscal life was healthy in mm -hmm. 76, 75. The cities wasn't. There were reasons to do this. Uh, different challenges are in place in, in both circumstances. That said, 
one can imagine ways in which this would work for all parties' benefit. You can also see issues and challenges that would make that a very difficult, very heavy lift, particularly at the moment when our political situation, uh, leadership situation sure. between the city is, is fluid. I think it's an idea worth talking about. Where it takes us uh, at this point, I'd reserve judgment. Okay, that's good. In the old days, when I was growing up, bachelor's degrees were the key degree. Yeah. Now it's master's degrees. For sure. Is it time for CUNY to put more emphasis on, I mean, teaching the master's program, I have to ask this, education on all of its campuses or emphases on the campuses that exist now? Unquestionably. I mean, for, for two reasons in my view. One is that what you've just suggested. The master's degree is increasingly becoming coin of the realm, the mm -hmm. entry-level degree that one requires. Aside from the career's point of view, it's also an intellectual history. Not, we live in a knowledge economy. Yep. I mean, that sounds like a cliche, but it's fundamental. And s graduates need more and more training. People need to return to school. They need to expand their, their, their credentials, their knowledge base, the rest of it. Graduate education is the way to, to proceed there. The other reason why it's so important for CUNY to do this is because of, the, again, the mission and the mandate to serve mm -hmm. the student. CUNY has provided extraordinary education, again, from the community college basis. We have remarkable community colleges through various certificate and degree programs, mm -hmm. continuing programs that aid people in their, in their lives, enrich their lives, baccalaureate programs. Our master's portfolio, in my judgment, is, is insufficient to meet that mission. And I think that has to be a target for investment from the university and an area of emphasis for the senior colleges that participate in master educa master's education. Clearly part of the portfolio that needs to be expanded. It also, are these, would this expansion of master's degrees include more professional degrees like the MPA, the MBA? When I, where, where are you, what are the opportunities and, and in a sense, what are the necessities? I, I, let me talk about both opportunities and necessities. Opportunities are vast. In my view, CUNY's focus on master's programs has been too narrow. It's focused largely on, on education programs, yep. preparing secondary school teachers and so forth and so on. Worthy enterprises all, mm -hmm. but not enough expansion to imagine where people need education, where they need training, what the market forces are that, that play into this, this question. The necessity, again, goes back to mission. I've looked at some cursory data. I've asked for more, uh, something I'll be looking at very early in this, uh, in this interim term. What happens to CUNY graduates who pursue doctorate? Where do they go? Right. right. And that, you know, these are not full data in this regard, but th they're enough to, to make some initial assumptions. And the assumption I make is that our graduates are paying more for less than they would at any CUNY college. And if we're not serving those needs, if we are not providing instruction in those professional areas that mm -hmm. you mentioned, if we're not doing the kind of market research essential to know where our students, where are where are, where are the citizens of right. the city, never right. mind us, where we need to help them to provide that graduate training that will enable them to enrich their lives in every sense of that term, then we're failing in our mission. And I think that has to be an expanded focus for this university. And it also has to have a broader vision of what we are training people to do. Are there trade-offs, though, with undergraduate education? There are always trade-offs. I mean, what I meant early, when I, when I was talking earlier about some of the challenges that one looks at in public higher education, do more with less is the, is the mantra. Um, fine, you know, what you're charged with doing is providing service to the public, programming, so forth and so on, continuing education undergraduate work, graduate work, and eventually colleges say, do we in fact have the resources to do that? Mm -hmm. It's one of the responsibilities of the chancellery, one that Matthew Goldstein has discharged with great credit, uh, is to provide those resources, to find them, to have colleges again constantly looking at how they are directing their resources. Do we share these things? Again, we go mm -hmm. back to this point. Mm -hmm. We are a large system separated by subways, or connected by subways, yep. not separated yep. by them. And I think there are ways to solve those issues. I think we have to. Specific, how do we raise, how do we get more, how do, be, in addition to using money more wisely, yeah. resources more wisely, are there 
relatively untapped sources, or is the, or or is that just a dream? Well, well, in fact, we've we've made some progress at the state level in terms of funding. But go ahead. Look, I mean, one of the reasons why CUNY has become a national model. I mean, you can't go to a conference and not be asked about about how CUNY manages yep. to do this. Has had. To, I mean, there are lots of lots of issues in play there, but one of them is is finance. We are in a stable situation. The state has pledged itself not to, to maintain stable funding uh -huh. operating costs for SUNY and CUNY for a five-year period. Right. I would argue that a lot of that success has had to do with what Chancellor Goldstein has called the compact, a partnership mm -hmm. in terms of, of modest tuition increases, significant effort on universities' part to use money more wisely and then to increase the available money from philanthropy, another stakeholder in the enterprise, and for uh, state stability in terms of maintenance of effort, of costs, and also uh, investment in new initiatives. Is that a perfect system? I mean, have we gotten every dollar we need? No. Of course not. But when one looks at other systems around the country, one sees this as a remarkable base on which to mm -hmm. build. To, rather than simply saying we need more money for these projects at a time when, as we were discussing earlier, demographics are not running in the interest of public higher education, Rather than doing that, suggesting models as the Chancellor, as Chancellor Goldstein has, um, I think gives us some opportunity to think about. That said, we need to expand our revenue streams, increase the portfolio. And we've seen progress in that area. We need to see more. Master's education isn't just a cost center. It also comes with tuition. Uh, and if you begin to sort of cost out what possibilities mm -hmm. exist for programs, you can you can, I think, quite readily understand how you will both serve the interest of the citizens of the city by providing enhanced uh, postgraduate education and at the same time make your bottom line healthier through the tuition that you're gathering in those programs. We have a couple of seconds left. At the end of your interimness, <laughs> how does Bill Kelly want to be remembered as that interim chancellor? I want to remem be remembered as a worthy successor to Matthew Goldstein, and that's a vast, vast ambition, given all that has happened in the time that Matthew has been doing this job. I go back to the notion of maintaining momentum rather than the formulation doing the same thing. I think the challenges that confront higher education confront CUNY as well. I think that we have an opportunity not only to serve our um, citizens, but also to contribute to the solution of public, the problems of public higher education. Mm -hmm. To the extent that I can move that conversation forward, that I can maintain that momentum, that I can also move the university in productive directions, I would count that interimness uh, a success. Good luck. <laughs> My special thanks to interim chancellor designate Bill Kelly for being on the show. Join me next week on City Talk here on CUNY TV. Thank nice. you, sir. Very Pleasure. nice. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email. Whatever it is, thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it. Send it.